back up. This is our politically incorrect advice time. This is the time where I'm going to tell you things that other people aren't going to tell you. I'm going to tell you things that you probably never thought you'd hear from somebody that works in the industry, but they make sense. And once we look at them, I think you'll find out they make a lot of sense. So we'll have a little bit of fun with this. So the first thing, the first thing right out of the bat is bad people make good hockey teams. So what do I mean about that? Bad people make good hockey teams. Look, there isn't a team that exists from the NHL to the OHL to NCAA hockey to anything in the, o, the, the USHL. There are going to be people on those teams where you look at it and say, I can't believe they get away with that. It could be curfews. It could be drinking. It could be um, not showing up on time. It could be doing things on the ice that are silly in your opinion, taking too much penalties, not passing the puck, being a puck hog, whatever you consider bad, those people are going to be on teams. Okay. Now you can be even more specific and say there's people with bad attitudes that are great hockey players and they make it all the way up to the NHL. And there's some very specific players that, you know, there's some players that went from Toronto to Pittsburgh and then on from Pittsburgh recently uh, that are American players that you've seen actually move through. Bad people play the game of hockey. When I mean bad people, people that, uh, in your opinion, could be doing bad things, okay? First of all, bad things when you're a teenager or you're a young man, uh, every kid's going to do something wrong, and, and different coaches handle those situations different. But it's not what I'm, when, I, when I say bad people, they're going to be there. You got to learn to deal with it. You have to, as a parent, as a player, go, okay. And then you got to move on and say, that's a teammate. Somebody else has got to handle that problem. Okay, that's not my problem and it's not mine. And it'll make more sense as we go along. But if you try to worry about the bad player, if you try to worry about the player that doesn't do what you think is the right things and you think he's a bad kid, this starts at mites. Folks, it may even be worse at mites. Okay. Of course, there's a little snot-nosed kid that does everything wrong, hits kids over the head with his sticks, trip kids, throws things, you know, they, yes, he's going to be there. But you know what? A year from now, two years from now, three years from now, that little snotty-nosed kid could be a wonderful altar boy kid. You don't know. That's not for us as parents or players to decide. Let the coach handle the coaching decisions. As parents, focus on doing what you can do best to make your player better. And as a player, if I'm watching this as a player right now, I'm saying the same thing. You know, don't worry about the bad. Worry about the good. Let the coach do the things that coaches do in the coaching. But if you expect to run into utopia because you move from U14 to U16, utopia is not there. If you think it's going to change when you jump from 16 to 18 to juniors, no, there's still going to be problems there. And if when you hear a coach, and this is the part that – there's going to be coaches out there and there's going to be scouts out there that disagree with me. Great players end up playing at the great level regardless of their attitude. And what I mean by that is you don't see an NHL first rounder that doesn't at least get a shot in the NHL if he's a first round uh, draft pick material. Now, he might not stay, but he's made it all the way up through on talent because people, not every coach will, but coaches will take chances on kids that have issues. It happens all the time. Okay, now a coach may only take one of those kids. He might not take 10 of them, but there's going to be bad people playing the sport of hockey, and you got to just deal with it. you got to cope. you got to be able to move on and focus on what you do and what you have to do and not worry about anything else. So, yes, there are bad people playing this game. I had a parent this week tell me every reason in the world why his kid, but you have a choice. If you don't like a kid because you think he does bad things, don't play on the team. Go find a different team. But you're not going to find the perfect team. There is no uh, situation. Now, coaches do a good job with team building. They do a good job with discipline. And different teams do varying degrees of good jobs with that. I'm not saying every team is perfect. But it doesn't mean they don't have discipline issues. They don't have problems. Uh, you know, uh, guys that won't get off the ice. The guys won't pass. All those issues, issues happen at all different levels. So uh, when we get there, it, it we'll uh, – uh, Sandra, I'll try to read that in a second, but I just want to make sure you got an idea of, of what bad people in, in, on good hockey teams means. Number two, being a late bloomer is not a strategy. Nothing irritates me more 
when I see these USA hockey people get online and get on Twitter and get on Facebook and all these different places and point out examples of late bloomers. You know, I don't understand why people would, would think that that's a positive thing. Yeah, it's good for the individual, but why is it good for the masses? Because being a late bloomer doesn't work. Okay, if you're going to expect it, oh, any day now. No, you know what works? Getting on the ice more. You know what works? Competing harder. Those things work. Expecting a late bloom doesn't work. In other words, you have to. If you're, if you're 10 or 12 years old right now and you're a family of a 10 or 12-year-old, awesome. Work harder. If you're not a first-line player, work harder. Okay? If you want to be a first-line player and you can't crack it on the team, drop down a level, be a first-liner on that team, or stay on the team you're at and don't complain. Work harder. There is no situation where late blooming is going to be an effective strategy for you. It just doesn't work. And I'll give you an example of some of the most famous right now, uh, most famous people that are late bloomers. And, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there was just a show on uh, ESPN and it was dealing with the Chicago Bulls. And those sh Chicago Bulls, you might remember those three guys. They just did the last dance. Phenomenal uh, uh, docu-series. That's uh, Scotty Pittman, uh, Pippen, Michael Jordan, and uh, Scotty B Pippen's on the right, Dennis Rodman's on the left, Michael Jordan's in the middle. Can you talk about a dominant uh, team? Can you talk about three players that figured out that are completely different from each other and actually figured out how to do it? Right there. Right there. Now, all three of these players, Michael Jordan got cut as a sophomore. He was a late bloomer. No. I'll explain why. Uh, Dennis Rodman didn't even play on the high school team. He's a late bloomer. No, that's not the truth. Okay, Scottie Pippen, he didn't start playing until his sophomore or junior year in college. The, all those things are true statements, but it wasn't because they were late bloomers. It was because this is what they look like. I don't know if you know this. This is, this is something most people don't know. They all went to the th same high school, and this is what they look like at high school graduation. They, Scottie Pippen was like 5'9 when he graduated. Uh, Jordan was in his mid fives in between his sophomore and junior year. He went up to six three, okay. Dennis Rodman grew like seventeen inches, okay. So this is th this is rare footage now. This is rare footage. I'm going to show you. Whoops, sorry about that. I'm going to show you. Oh boy, some rare footage right now. This is a high school game with those three playing. It was a high school all star game that these three played in. Told you we weren't going to be politically correct tonight, didn't I? I think I made it very clear we weren't going to be politically correct. My point is, all three of those guys grew almost a foot apiece. That's why they became great players. Jordan's skill set, yeah, he was a hard worker. He was a hard worker before and he was a hard worker after he grew. But he still wouldn't have been a starter if he stayed at the same height. You'd have never heard the name Scottie Pippen if he didn't have a growth spurt. You would have never heard of Dennis Rodman if he was still 5'6 when he was in, in college. You can't be a number one uh, rebounder. You cannot be a number one rebounder in the, NA, in the NBA if you're not close to seven foot like he was, between six, eight, and seven foot, whatever he was. Now, that's the point I'm making. There are so many things that late bloomers are. Mostly, late bloomers fall into two categories. Late bloomers fall into growth spurt category or change of sport and focus category. In other words, I was a baseball player, and a hockey player, and I gave up baseball and focused on hockey. Now, that's a late bloomer because somebody that decided to get serious about it, maybe a little bit later in other ones, they can make a big jump in it. But somebody that's been serious about the sport for 14 or 15 years or been playing since they were three and they're 17 now, the odds of a late blooming situation popping out of that, don't count on it. So when I say it's not a strategy, that's what I mean. It's not a strategy. All right, let's get rolling on this list. I told you tonight... Tonight's not a politically correct night. They will not find you. Nothing irritates me more than walking into a rink and seeing that salty old coach sitting over on the side going, oh, just play, just play high school, just play you know, for the local team. If you're good enough, they'll find you. If they're good enough, they'll find you. That's absolutely Absolutely the 
dumbest thing I've ever heard in hockey. You have to market yourself. And I'm going to give you another example because I'm on a roll for examples tonight. Here's my example tonight. This is my boat. Well, it was my boat. I sold it last spring. Okay. I love this boat. This boat, I, I redid the whole boat. 320 horsepower. Ooh, fast. 55 miles an hour on the water. Ooh, just adored this boat. About four years ago, went to the wife and I said, I know you don't like riding the boat. It's too fast for my son because he only knew one speed. And really, you got to be able to temper it or know how to, you know, control the boat with that kind of speed in the water. It's a little too fast for me even. So we decided we're going to sell this boat. The boat didn't sell for four years. Secretly, I didn't really want to sell the boat. So I kind of found ways to sell it, but not sell it. So it sat in the driveway and I told my wife, eventually somebody will drive by, see the boat. It's a beautiful boat and they'll want it. Okay, four years. But then all of a sudden I decided, to, you know what, I got to get serious about this. It's a really good, it's good. You know, the, 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 the neighborhood association starting to say, you know, do something with that boat. We're not using the boat as much as we used to. It's sitting in the driveway all the time. I decided to market the boat. I decided to put signs on the boat. I decided when I took the boat out to the marina, I'd have signs on it that said for sale. I put it on eBay. I put it on Craigslist. I went to boats.com, whatever, all these different places. And within 48 hours, I sold the boat because I marketed the boat. And if you think that if you're just going to play and they're going to find you, there's nobody there that's, that's looking for you. I always ask the question, who is they? Okay, do you think the USHL is looking at, at anything but the highest of high levels for players? Okay, they will find you if you're on a top HPHL team. They will find you if you're playing Tier 1 Elite for one of the big boys or one of the independents. They will find you if you're playing in the Beast League. They're not searching into Tier 2 leagues. They're not searching into house leagues. It just doesn't happen. So when I say they will find you or they won't find you, that's because nobody's looking for you unless you market yourself. You can even be, now here's a perfect example. You can be on a tier one elite team. You can be the fifth best player on that team. All of a sudden, four college coaches walk in, four college coaches are taking notes on the whole game. And you and your parents after the game, or even during the game, you're excited. You see all these top college coaches walking in. You know they're watching your team and they, you know that they're taking notes on your team. You're the fifth best, best player. You think you're going to get notes written on you. Four players get written up, and it's the top four players. And not because they're the top four players. It's because your coach's job is to knock off one player before he works about, worries about two. So your, your youth coach, your 16, 18 coach on that Tier 1 Elite team is probably trying to get the first two or three guys out of the way. So he's suggesting that those co college coaches look at the guys that are uncommitted and who start, starts from the top down. Okay, But those other four players all reach down to those schools with emails and with texts and with phone calls. They talk to those coaches at showcases. They did everything they could to make sure their name was out there. They branded themselves, they marketed themselves, and they pushed themselves. So when those coaches walk in the door, they've already got a list. And, and, and being a former college coach and a former junior coach, I got two columns. I got the columns of kids that I want to watch from whatever, you know, from our scouting staff, wherever. Then I got the, the kids that reached out to us on the list too. Now, I might want not watch a lot of the kids, a lot of the shifts of the kids that reached out to us because I might go, yeah, you reached out to us, but I'm going to at least give them a look because he reached out to us. And then I'm going to work down what the college said and what our scouts said. I'm going to work through that list. There's a chance that you're the fifth best player, sixth best player, seventh best player on the team. You could have the best game and never have eyes on you. And partially, that's your fault. Not because you did something wrong on the ice. It's because you're not marketing yourself. You can't wait for somebody to find you. You can't wait for that coach to come to you, you have to make sure that you put yourself in a spot where you know when that coach walks in the door, he's going to watch you. It's up to you, nobody else. That's why emails, texts, you know, video, clips on YouTube, all those things are essential, absolutely essential if you're going to get this done right. It doesn't matter what level you want to make. I'm starting off saying D1 and with a tier one elite, but you can move that down to D3 hockey and it doesn't change a thing. 
you could be playing in the EHL. You could be looking to try to play for one of the uh, best, you know, uh, NESCAC schools in the in the Boston area. And that coach walks in the door. You want to make sure he knows who you are ahead of time. And it, it is not the responsibility of your coach. It's good that your coach works. And a, a, believe me, most coaches at that level, youth coaches at that level, are trying to do everything to get players put into place. But I can't start at number five on my list until I get one, two, and three, and four done. So, yes, one gets out of the way and he commits. It makes it easier. So getting back to what we said earlier about the panic, there's nothing better right now if you are on that – I'm using Avalanche, but it could be Honey Bake. It could be uh, different teams. If I'm a 16 and I see my left wing and my right wing commit, that's awesome. Because now when a college coach comes, there's more eyes on me because those guys are out of the picture now. Bingo. Done. That means I get a chance to get more eyes on me. Remember, there's 20 kids on your roster. You don't know what that college coach is watching, and he cannot. He cannot watch 20 kids. You, that number five player, could have the best shift, end-to-end rush, you know, do everything to get through the D, split 2D, put it upstairs, great goal. But he might be watching that defenseman behind the play because he was the first kid he was coming to watch to see how that kid stayed in the play, never watched the puck, never seen what you did because he had his eyes somewhere else on the ice. The only way those eyes change is if you're doing everything you can to change those. Soapbox, told you, tonight wasn't going to be a pretty night. Tonight wasn't going to be a nice night. I'm ranting, politically incorrect, feeling a little ornery tonight. You're going to see a little bit of that. So let's get back to my list. Why are you not listing for me your list? Oh, this is the best one. This one is the one that is going to irritate people when they first read it. Selfish players are the best players. Did I just say that? Selfish players are the best players. Give me a team, give me 20 selfish players, and I'll win championships. Give me 20 selfish players, and I'll go somewhere with a team. What do I mean by that? A selfish player gets in that locker room and is focused because he's worried about everything he needs to worry about. He got sleep the night before because he's selfish. He ate the right meal because he's selfish. He's on time because he's selfish. If he's late, he knows he's got all kinds of distractions. He's got to deal with that coach. He's got to deal with things if, if he doesn't show up on time. Okay, He doesn't get worried about little things and little distractions because he's selfish. A selfish player is the best player you can have. If you don't believe it, you don't think Wayne Gretzky was selfish or Mark Messier. Look at some of the great players around right now. You know how you can tell they're selfish? Watch what happens when they get off the ice. Are their eyes going everywhere? Are they jumping around? Are they chatting? Are they smiling? Are they trying to see where their girlfriend's at in the crowd? Are they winking at their mom saying, hey, mom, how are you doing over there? No. They get off the ice. Their head drops. They look up, they take a drink of water. They might watch the play a little bit to stay involved in the game, but they're focused. Selfish players are great. Now, I'm not, yeah, 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 I'm going to get into this. Many of you, many of you have heard my chocolate cake story, but I'm going to throw it out there again. Abbreviated, going to keep it shorter. Toronto game's on, I get it. You don't want to be stuck with you know, this old guy talking to you all night long. But the chocolate cake story goes something like this. Team's getting ready to play. They get done with their little warm-ups. They're up running back and forth, jump rope and skipping. They all get back in the locker room. They're getting dressed. Ten minutes before the game, most of them are dressed. Into the locker room walks fat little Johnny. Remember I told you tonight was not a politically correct night. Fat little Johnny's got the biggest smile on the face. Now, this is a true story. Names have not been changed. I'm not going to give you last names, but names have not been changed in this story to protect the innocent. This is a reality. This actually happened. My team. Fat little Johnny walks in the locker room, and he's excited. What does he have in his hand? He's got a piece of chocolate cake. One of his friends on the other rink, little brother was having a birthday party, and Johnny just happened to be walking by after warm-ups, popped his head in, and said, hey. And they said, Johnny, come on in. Get a piece of cake. And he went, sure. Johnny brings that cake back in the locker room. So now there's all kinds of dynamics. And anybody you want to talk about team dynamics, you see it all in this situation. Because he's still in his grays from his warm-ups, from his little runs and jump ropes. Wasn't very good at that because, once again, it's fat little Johnny. Gets in the locker room. His two line mates come over. 
they both sit down next to him and they're all happy and they're looking at it like, hey, Johnny, give me a piece too. Well, the assistant captain and the other assistant captain are sitting in the other two corners. They got the, the, you know, the, uh, the leadership complex thing going on. They both bolt up like you know the, the sergeant of arms of the locker room and they run over and they're going to instill their discipline. You know, they're yelling at players, get, sit down, you got to get dressed, got to get focused, everything's going on. Now you got the assistant captains and their following are going one direction. You got Johnny sitting in the middle just looking at that cake, can't wait to touch it, can't wait to jump in. Got his little plastic fork and he's ready to go. His two line mates are right there with him, fourth line players, right there with him. They want to jump into that cake too. You got a couple people yelling at him from across the room. Coach walks in. First thing he does is go, Captain, what the heck is going on in here? And you know what his captain did? Nothing. Because his captain was sitting there. My captain was sitting there. I didn't walk in. The assistant coach actually walked in. The captain was sitting there focused. He looked up at the coach and he goes, Coach, if I get involved with this, the whole team is distracted before the game. I didn't think you wanted that. And the captain looked right back down and stayed focused. Okay? That's a selfish player, yes. But... That's a player that learned over time. He can't get distracted by the music of this guy. He can't get distracted by the soda can of this guy. He can't get distracted by this guy, you know, trying to make all of his friends laugh over here, laughing over here. What he's got to do is come in the locker room and focus on himself. And we use that, and I used that story for 20 straight years after it happened and actually literally taught it to every single team, junior, college, uh, U8 team that I coached since then because it was so powerful. Walk in, focus on yourself. If the ceiling's falling in on one side of the locker room and it's not on you, you stay focused. That's a selfish player. So when I say selfish, I don't mean this in a negative way. I mean this in an extremely, extremely positive way. If you walk in and that's the only thing you're worried about is what you've got to do to get ready, then you're a hockey player. Now you're moving somewhere, some good things can happen for you. Last one. Set your own rules. Don't worry about the team rules. You set your rules. Now, once again, holy smokes, this guy's nuts. Now he's telling us, don't worry about the team rules. Just go in and set your own rules. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm going to give you the three rules. Go get your pen. Go get your pen. Go get your paper real quick. I'll wait. I'm not going to wait. I get, I'm, I'm, I'm too fired up. But I'm going to tell you right now, here's the three rules. Be on time. Be coachable and respect every single aspect of that team and the rink and the people around you. Because if you're on time, you have no issues with the team rules. You, you, those three rules, on time, respectful, and coachable, means that you're bought into everything that could possibly be put in paper. And when I first started this, I was a road warrior that carried a binder that started out with a couple pages of rules by the time I was in about my fifth or sixth season, I had a three-ring binder of team rules that was probably 30 pages long. I'm married to a lawyer, too. It didn't help. They didn't, she didn't help me at all on that. Just kept adding, well, oh, there's a bylaw clause about that. You know. No. Three rules. Be on time, be respectful, and be coachable. If you do that, along with being selfish, you're golden. Whatever the team rules are, you're going to abide by them because you're on there on time and you're listening to the coach. Is there any better way to be than setting your rules and setting your standards higher than the rest of the team? If you're selfish and you have your own rules, now you're in a spot where you absolutely are setting yourself up for success to be recruited and to find those things. Now, you can tie into the marketing side of this and you can tie into you know, strategy and branding yourself. All those things are things I do in webinars. That's, that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking about setting yourself up to have the best possible successful season with a team regardless of the bad people regardless of the coach you could have the best coach or the worst coach put yourself in a spot to be successful and you do that by being a selfish player that puts the time into setting his rules first before he worries about any team rules because your rules can last your whole hockey career team rules will change every single season hell there's coaches that will change their own rules or don't abide by their own rules so if you've got rules that are tougher than the coaches, you're going to be set. You're going to be putting yourself in a very positive situation. What do you think about that? Too far tonight? Too politically correct or incorrect? 
So I hope you enjoyed that. And, uh, oh, the store is still one nothing. Ooh, ooh, still tight game. I'm surprised we got a, a big of audience. We were up in the 50s for a while. Remember, this, I, I never can figure this out. We get only 30, 40, 50 people at a time live. Now, over the course of the whole hour, you know, there, there's a couple hundred people. Then we put this on replay, and it goes nuts. It goes through the roof on the numbers. This week wasn't as great because the NHL's been back, and we're, we're fighting that. You know, I don't have the pandemic audience the way uh, locked the way I used to, so my market share is going back to the NHL. Hey, listen, I want to get to the one question that came in. I just got to find it again. Let's see if I can scroll back and uh, put that uh, together that came in earlier. So Tom asked a question. Uh, so same time, Mark, yes, it is same time every week. We do the show every uh, Sunday night at 9 o'clock. Uh, Tom's question was, I have a question for you. Do you recommend uh, a particular website or listing for your child's hockey accomplishments uh, and academic as well? Uh, and what do you recommend gets posted uh, or not posted? Okay, so there, there, that's, that's a little bit of a loaded question. The reason that's a loaded question is um, it depends. Okay, if you're at a club level of play, ACHA level of play, some of these, these uh, online sites that collect your information and build a portfolio for you are looked at. Some ACHA coaches will, you know, pull that. Virtually no junior coach is using those sites. Uh, either they're using uh, a backdoor site that uh, we've talked about before and it's in a lot of my videos. You know, there's, there's a whole, from the NHL all the way down to junior hockey, there's a, there is a uh, professional site that's used, and that site is tied into everything, and it, it allows the uh, coaches to pull uh, uh, scouting reports. It allows a coach and a, and a general manager to know where all the scouts are at all times, what players they're covering, who's got coverage in every area. That's the first thing that's happening. So that information is gleaned from, uh, from scouting reports from all different sources, and uh, it also – is tied into um, uh, things like Elite Prospects. Elite Prospects is absolutely your best source to make sure your information's on, and you don't really have much control. You do now because they, they, it's changed. I don't know much. In the last month, they've just added this, this new, more recruiting side of it where you can add your own information and you can put information up. Uh, but Elite Prospects is used by virtually everybody in the industry because it's accurate, it's thorough, and if you're playing anywhere, that information will populate uh, your league or your team will populate that for you. You don't have to put the quote unquote information in except for the new paid version, which once again, I don't know much about the new paid version. Um, I was hesitant to see the paid side come out because they had a they had a pure information side. I didn't want it to get subjective with uh, parents or players starting to muddy the waters. So elite prospects is really where you start if you're, you're playing at the higher level. If you're playing at the mid-level or lower level, you're playing tier two, um, then you're in a situation where you want to use one of those other sites. It's probably not going to hurt you, but you're not going to get the North American Hockey League. You're not going to get the uh, USHL or the CGHL teams looking at those, uh, those one-off sites. Most of them, now I'm not going to call out names on this, most of them are what are called vanity sites. And if they're collecting your information and, and ask you for information on your player or say, we've got a big feature coming out on your player, that's a, uh, that's a, a well-known tactic in this industry. We're going to write a big story on your player. And you're like, wow, they're going to interview my player. He's going to be in this publication. Then they ask you to subscribe you know, for whatever the amount of money is. And it can be big money. Some of these, some of these sites charge you $150 to subscribe or they charge you 30 bucks a month or something. And their hope is that you keep your subscription uh, from age 10 when they wrote the article or age 12 when they wrote the article all the way through uh, to when you're actually you know, done with hockey. Or maybe you forget forever and you just keep doing it. So that's, that's the biggest part of that is, Tom, is to make sure you understand that these, uh, the vanity sites are the ones you got to worry about. And you'll figure that out real quick. Vanity sites are, uh, there's, there's numerous ones of them. And if they ask you, to subscribe after they interviewed. In other words, they write the article, they give you the first two or three lines of the article and say, here's the article we wrote on your son. And then you pull up the site and there's like 80 kids that they wrote articles on uh, and they want you to subscribe. Well, there's 80 other kids that got articles written on them that day or that week too. So just be cognizant of that. 
But what you can do, and this is something that's become much more popular with players, with parents, and with coaches, and with advisors uh, lately, is putting together a 90-second at tops, you don't have to go nuts with this, uh, enhancement video, where you actually are showing you know, a back check, a pass, a, a goal. Don't load it up with you know, the three goals he had in a shootout in a scrimmage. You know, what you want to do is show a little bit of each part of your game. Um, some people put it to music.